Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for being with us here tonight. I'm Cynthia Knight. Thank you. And I'm the director here of the Barron Arts Center. And on behalf of myself and our program coordinator, Brandon Powell, I would like to welcome you to this evening's select lecture presented by Marianne Zalata. Some of you who attended the earlier lecture are familiar with Marianne. And we are pleased to have here. Uh, Ms. Zalata received her BA in Art History from Drew University and her MA from Rutgers University. With 20 years lecturing experience, Ms. Zalata has lectured in various venues, including the Saborn, Cristal, and Regent cruise ships. Since 2009, Ms. Zalata has lectured at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Rutgers University. Tonight, we will be visiting Vijay Lebron, and Marianne will be presenting the lecture. But prior to her beginning the lecture, it's a good time now. Let's turn those cell phones off so we can have some quiet. And at this time, I will give over the floor to Marianne. Marianne, we are so glad to have you Thank back you. here. Thank you. It's something I've been looking forward to all month, really. Just wonderful. And Thank you. This lecture kind of completes or falls into line with our series on the popular museums. So I, many of you probably were here before on the Louvre. That was our first one. So Vijay Lebron falls right into where you left off. So enjoy the evening. You know, I was the one that, in a sense, uh, insisted that uh, we do this lecture at this particular time because the V.J. Lebrun show is currently on at the Metropolitan Museum. This show, uh, com comprising approximately 80 paintings, has come from the uh, Petit Palais in Paris, where I saw it initially in September. Now, in the pa Parisian uh, exhibition, they had 150 paintings altogether. They've only brought 80 of them to the Met, and it's really sad because there's, there's a lot of gray wall space, which is kind of empty, and I'm sure they could have, could have squeezed in easily another eight to 10 paintings. Uh, but anyway, I did want you to be familiar with this, so if you decide to go to the Met, the show, by the way, ends on the 15th of May. So you still have a good solid two weeks to get into the Met to see it, and it is absolutely wonderful. It truly is. I was there this past Sunday, and it wasn't mobbed either. But normally the last Sunday, it, the last Sunday of the last weekend, it probably will be mobbed. All right, so let's start talking about Elizabeth V.J. Lebrun. I think I have the correct button here. Yes. First of all, she was born in April of 1755, and at the age 12, she, by the age of 12, she was trained by her father. Uh, she had been sent away to a school, to a Catholic school, and she uh, really frustrated the nuns by constantly drawing on, in her notebook and whatnot. And her parents brought her home at the age of 12, and they realized that she was very, very artistic. Now, her father was an artist. Her mother was a hairdresser. Now. Um, by age 15, she was supporting her mother and, and brother because at the age of 13, her father died. He had only trained her for about a year. Uh, about seven months afterward, the mother married a jeweler, a Monsieur Lesevre, because uh, the family was ser in serious need of money. And he turned out to be um, not a very nice person, very, very... Um, uh, penny-pinching and kind of mean to the family. So she began painting. She was going for some studies uh, with a local, uh, a local woman artist, and she uh, began painting and selling her works. And so that she was the support of the family by she's 15, by the time she was 15, and she was giving money to her stepfather in order for, to, uh, for in, order to in order to make the mother feel comfortable, shall we say. Now, um, Nope, I'm sorry. Okay, by 1774, she had her first exhibit at the Academy of St. Luke because the um, guild members, the guild came in and seized all her working materials because she wasn't a member of the guild. But of course, as I say, she was trying to support the family. So um, she became a member of the Ac Academy of St. Luke at the age in 1774 when she was 19 years old. And in 1776, she married Jean-Baptiste Lebrun, who was an artist and also an art dealer. Now, at this time, the family was living in an apartment, and, and he had an exhibition, ex exhibition space on the main floor, and he would uh, give her uh, uh, 
works of art to copy and whatnot. And the mother encouraged the marriage because she felt that he was rather well off. But it turned out to be a very unhappy marriage, which she states in her souvenirs, which are her memoirs, which she wrote about uh, two or three years before she died. Now, um, her daughter, Julie, is born in 1780. There was another child that came along four years later that unfortunately died. Now, by 1783, she became one of the few members of the Royal Academy of Painters, in doubt, no, in, no part, in part, no doubt, because of her royal patronage which, with Maria Antoinette, which we shall discuss in a few minutes. Okay, so she was elected in 1784. She continued a very successful career in France until 1789. When the king and queen, however, were captured by the mob and taken back to Paris, she realized that um, things were a little bit, getting a little bit sticky for her because she was one of the recognized portraitists of the queen and she realized that, that, that things might get very difficult for her. Now, she and her daughter then went off to Italy uh, she went with very little money. She talks, she mentions that in her souvenir. She had very little money, but they went off to Italy, and I'll be discussing her travels in a few moments. Now, there were also indications at this time that there were rumors flying around, then again, there were always rumors flying around in France, <laughs> that her reputation had been tainted by adultery, but we don't really know whether or not this is true. In Rome, she was elected to the in Rome, she was elected to the Academy of Disegno, and she continued working in Italy very successfully. By 1791, she had accepted an invitation to go to Vienna and paint. She could not return to France. In fact, her husband and brother were briefly imprisoned in 1793, and in 1794, her husband divorced her, probably wanted to, wanting to disassociate himself from her and her royal connections. Now, in 1795, at the uh, suggestion of a, um, of a Russian aristocrat, one of the, the uh, ambassador to the Vienna court, she went off to St. Petersburg, Russia, where she remained for six years. Now, doing numerous portraits of the Russian aristocrats, they, she had them lined up. She had no problem with earning a living at all. She was made a member of the academy in Russia, and. Um, now you may say, well, she has six years now. She really must have had a hard time with the language. Well, she really didn't, because the French aristocrats did not speak Russian, only to the servants. Among themselves, they spoke French, so that she was right at home, and of course, they welcomed her with open arms. Uh, Catherine the Great also spoke French, by the way, and she did meet Catherine the Great twice, although she never, she never uh, painted Catherine the, Great's portrait, uh, Catherine the Great's portrait, but she did meet her twice. Now, in 1801, the art, 225 artists in France petitioned her, petitioned the government to allow her to return to France. She did return, a, a year, um, two years later, she returned to St. Petersburg first for six months, thence to Berlin, and finally to Paris, where she lodged in the home of her ex-husband. By 1803, however, she went back to, um, back to London. She was doing some work there, then Holland and Belgium. And finally, she returned to Paris in 1806. Now, she had had a severe um, a break with her daughter because her daughter had married against her wishes in St. Petersburg. She had met a, um, a, a young man who was the secretary to the, to the Royal Theater, the Imperial Theater there, and uh, she, Vijay did not feel that this would be a good match for her daughter, but the daughter insisted on marrying him, and indeed it was a very unsuccessful marriage. However, she was finally reconciled with her daughter in 1819, which was um, 1818, and Julie died in 18, 1819. Vijay herself lived until 1842. She was taken care of by her two nieces. She had a brother, and the brother had two daughters, and she was taken care of by the two nieces. And it was her nieces who suggested that she write her memoir, which she did a few years before she died.
Now, I'm going to, so we're going to start looking at some family portraits, first of all. Well, this is not a family portrait, but this is an example of her father's work, Louis Viget. This pastel drawing by her father demonstrates his mastery of that pastel and he, that he passed on to his daughters. Now, pastel is a crayon. As a matter of fact, the best pastels are still made in France and they're handmade as well. And it's generally done on a textured paper. So as you draw on the paper, the paper uh, grabs, the, grabs the, the pigment, you see. And uh, beautiful. Um, this. Unfortunately, this reproduction is a little darker than the actual pictures. The reproductions, um, in other words, when I show you these reproductions, the machine, it goes through the machine, and many times the colors are not true to life. The colors are not true to life with this, okay? So I want you to be aware of that. Also, you must realize that when I show you this, I am showing you a reproduction of a reproduction, because I have to get the, uh, the picture and I put it in my PowerPoint, and then I reproduce it in the PowerPoint. So you, you are not seeing any, anything anywhere near the original. It's two degrees removed from the original. Now, this is a portrait of her mother, Madame Lesseve, and her brother Etienne at the age of 15. He's going off to school, young lad, bouncing off to school. And um, they were very close, by the way. Etienne grew up to be a writer and a critic, and he also went to jail uh, during, the, uh, during the reign of terror for a few months. He was also jailed. So um, they ha he had a, a difficult time in France when she ha as, when, after she had already left. Now, the next portrait, next picture I'm going to show you, this is uh, Claude Joseph Vernet. After, she, um, after her father died, Vernet was a friend of the family, and he kind of took her under his wing. He uh, showed her various techniques of art. He also suggested that she study, go to the museums and study the old masters, which she did study Rubens and whatnot. And she also took lessons from another, another lady nearby, a Madame Filoul, who was a, a woman artist and whose daughter, Rosalie Filoul, she was very, good, very, very good friends with. And I'm gonna talk about Rosalie Filoul in a little while, okay? Now, here is a picture of her husband. It's a self-portrait of Jean-Baptiste Lebrun. Um, he's, as you can see, he holds the palette as an artist, but he also holds a book, and there is a sculpture in, indicating that he is a learned man, and also, of course, he was a, um, as you know, he was a dealer. Um, he really looks kind of wimpy to me, and that hat looks a little bit large for him, but I mean, uh, they did not have a successful marriage at all, and the mother had encouraged it, but it was all wrong, okay? Uh, he, uh, she claims in, the, in her memoirs that he took all her money and gave her very little in return. That was whatever she earned was his money, so to speak. Uh, and she said that when she left for Italy, that she left with very little money in her pocket. Uh, but fortunately, she was able to uh, make a living. She made a living for herself and her daughter for something like 12 solid years as an exile wandering all over Europe. Here is her brother, Etienne. That, is, that was done by another artist, not by her, by, by Adele Romani. And there is Suzanne Viget, her sister-in-law, whom she painted. Uh, and you, you see the liveliness in, in, in Suzanne Viget, the little smile on her face, the turn of the head, everything. Viget had a way of making all of her sitters extremely lively, especially the women, especially the women. And you will see this as we, as we go through the lectures. And here is her daughter, Julie. Julie looking in a mirror. She also had a gift for portraying children doing what children do. Now, this is a very clever painting. It's absolutely one of her best, one of her best. And Julie is looking in a mirror. She's looking sideways, but we see her in full face. In other words, um, Vijay's tweaked the painting a little bit, you see. But just absolutely marvelous. Little girl looking in the mirror and Again, beautiful colors. Um, she was also very masterful at iridescence on, and silken fabric. So masterful that I think she's probably one of the best I've ever seen. There's only one other that I have seen that's as good as she is, and that is none other than Jan Steen, the Dutch artist from the 17th century. And on Sunday, when we went to the show, I dragged my friend with me upstairs to the, Ste to the Dutch exhibition, and I made her look at one of the Steen paintings to see the wonderful way in which he did iridescence. But her, her iridescence of these, 
is absolutely marvelous because you realize in those days people wore these silks and the silk of course reflected the light so beautifully. Now you will, we will see this and I'll point this out to you as we go along. Now we're going to start with the 1700s and I am in, interspersing here within this lecture uh, uh, let's say uh, pastels and also drawings. Now this is a self-portrait that she did in 1783. It's a little later than the 1770s. But I wanted to show you, this is a black chalk and charcoal drawing on cream paper. How she manages to capture the various textures of the feathers, the ringlets of hair, the dress ruffles, contra contrasted with the solidity of the hat. Now she used hats in many of her portraits because hats frame faces so very nicely. And you have a lovely circle which kind of embraces, embraces the face. Let's look at this now. Here is a painting she did of a man, Prince Charles of Nassau Sagan. He, uh, the, pr the term prince, uh, he shouldn't have been using it, but he did, okay. He was, he was the illegitimate son of somebody who had been uh, another illegitimate son of a, of a count or something. So he's calling himself the Prince of Sagan Nassau. He really was quite a, quite a character. Um, he joined an exhibition to go to the South Seas, not because he wanted to go on a boat or for a cruise, but because he was in such bad debt, all his creditors were chasing after him. So the one way to get away from it was to go to go we at sea, okay. After that, he came back and he went to Russia and uh, offered to uh, do, uh, work for Catherine the Great, but Catherine the Great thought he was, she, she called him a crazy fellow. And the same uh, opinion of him was held by John Paul Jones, who uh, John Paul Jones worked also for uh, Catherine the Great, uh, went to, and, in her Navy, and even he said that, uh, that she was not a, not a trustworthy guy at all. But here, she paints him as a man of the world. He has his hand on a glove globe, indicating, of course, travel. He's pointing to a book, and of course, the column behind denotes solidity and, and, and steadfastness, uh, all the things he was not, okay? And um, beautifully dressed, no, notice, the, notice the velvet suit that he has on with the very fancy gold embroidery, again, indicating his status, because in those days, your clothes gave you your status. For example, if you were a royal person, as Louis XIV, remember I pointed out to you last month that Louis XIV wore sh black shoes with red heels? Only the aristocracy could wear red heels, okay? So there were, there were little things, little indications of what your social status was. <clears throat> All right, now, she did very few genre paintings, but I decided to put this in just to give you an idea. Now, a genre painting is, is nothing more than a, a, a little incident in people's lives, and this is called the Spanish Concert. Now, why are this, is it called the Spanish Concert? Because the guitar the young man holds is a Spanish guitar, okay, the, the guitar right there. And we know that because it's inset with ebony wood. And they were very popular in the 17th and 18th century. And even though they may not have been made in Spain, they were called Spanish guitars. So the, the painting is called the Spanish Concert. And the music has paused. The lady is, is singing. And it looks as if it's a romantic interlude. Remember, music. Um, is symbolic when, it, when you, a couple like that is playing music together. It's a symbol. It's a symbolic of falling in love or making beautiful music together in harmony with each other. Okay, so this is really a kind of a romantic interlude. And notice that off to the side, the servant is peeking into the scene to see what's happening. The lady herself is in a very very. Casual, casual pose, and um, the young man looks down at her, and uh, with with no doubt some romantic interest as well. Now, in 1778, she scored probably one of the uh, highlights of her life when she was asked to paint a painting of Maria Marie Antoinette, and this was to have been sent to Marie Antoinette's mother. It was back in Austria. It was in Austria. She was the she was the Empress of Austria, by the way. Okay. Now here is the painting she did of Marie Antoinette. Again, the color is all wrong, so you'll have to excuse me because that is not the. It, it's awfully harsh, but it's not that way in real life. Now this is an enormous painting. Okay. 
She reached the height of her career when she was commissioned to do this formal court. This is a formal court portrait, okay? She is wearing formal dress of the time. The painting is huge. It is 107 inches by high by 75 inches wide, which must have meant that she had to get on some kind of stepladder to, to finish it or to, to work from the top down or whatever. Now, um, <clears throat> she wears the court dress of the time, which was rigidly, rigidly codified even to the corset that she was forced to wear. When she, Marie Antoinette was extremely thin, and she decided after a while the corset was so so hard to wear and she was very uncomfortable in it, she stopped wearing it, thinking nobody would know it. Well, the, the, the rumor went all over the court that she was no longer wearing her corset. And this was, the, I mean, this was absolute, an absolute outrage to the French. We, we look upon it as being so silly today, and yet they, they, this was very rigidly followed by everybody. And when she decided not to wear the corset, she was, in a sense, flaunting the rules of the French. Now, remember, she was not French, she was Austrian. But she came to Paris, to France, at the age of 14. She was still. She was still very much the petted younger child at home, and here she is thrust into this new situation with a new language, a new court. Um, and there were many, many people who disapproved of her, of, her, of her behavior because she was very exuberant. If she saw somebody, she'd run up to them and give them a big hug. That was not allowed in France because you were not allowed to touch any royal individual. So it, it was like she's flaunting the rules. She doesn't, she doesn't know, in other words, she doesn't know our code. She doesn't know the way we do things here. She's a foreigner. She's an Austrian, OK? Now, the costume itself exudes fashion, elegance, status, and power as well. Note at the top here, there is a, a bust of her husband, Louis XVI. And uh, she is, uh, this dress is a, is a huge confection. Now, the What's holding the dress out is what they call, used to call panniers, which really were like little basket-shaped hoops that you wore around your waist, which brought the dress out the way it did. Now, sometimes the dress was so wide that you couldn't get to the door except by going sideways. Very inconvenient, but nonetheless, this was the style, okay? Now, <clears throat> she... <clears throat> She stands again by a column, which is, which is symbolic of stability and strength. Now, Lebrun became a favorite of Marie Antoinette. They had both been born in 1855, so they were basically the same age. Marie Antoinette's birthday, by the way, is November the 2nd, but uh, uh, VJ had been born in April. <clears throat> and they both had disappoint disappointing marriages. Uh, Marie Antoinette did not have a child for the first seven years of her marriage, and everyone was pointing fingers at her and giggling, even though it was really her husband's fault and not her fault, okay? Uh, Marie Antoinette's first child, a daughter, was, which was a disappointment again. Oh, she only had a girl. She couldn't, she, no, she didn't have the requisite heir to the throne, which would have been a boy, okay? So that was another boo-boo that she pulled, accidentally having a girl. So, you know, all these things worked against her. Now, Vijay's child was born in 1780, and she said of this portrait, your wonderful portrait delighted me. Um, they, uh, ultimately, though, the fate of Vijay Lebrun would be tied to Marie Antoinette. We'll be talking about this as we go along. Now, here is another, pa uh, another painting that she did. Sorry, I'm... This is Louis Philippe, the Duc d'Orléans. He was known as the Fat Duke, and he was the king's cousin, by the way. This is a pastel that she did in 1779. Um, he also had a terrible case of acne rosacea that Vijay kindly showed as simply rosy cheeks, okay? He loved luxury, he was indecisive, and he was gluttonous. Um, he was much admired, though, by none other than Thomas Jefferson who, when he came to Paris, uh, saw that, the, that uh, Louis Philippe was, by the way, the richest man in, in, in France. He was richer than the king, okay? He had turned his property in Paris into an outdoor mall with shops and musical entertainment and restaurants and whatnot. So, of course, he was able to collect rents from all these places and, you know, made out like a bandit, shall we say? Okay. Um, he was enormously rich and was the lover of Grace Elliott, who's the subject of one of my other lectures. He was called Philip Egalité because he voted for the king's execution. Now, what goes around comes around because a year later, well, 
in 17, November of 1793. Louis was executed in January of 1793. He was executed in November of 1793, okay? But his son, Louis Philippe, they also arrested his two children, his son. Two, two, two boys were arrested. They must have been let go because uh, Louis Philippe, his son, later became the king of France from 1830 to 1848 until there was another revolution which ousted Louis Philippe. The French always are having these revolutions every few years, okay? Now, let's go to the 1780s. Here is another one of her self-portraits called, also known as maternal affection, showing the warmth between a mother and child that was not usually shown in family portraits. We saw at the beginning her portrait with her, her daughter and they're hugging each other and it, there was a lot of, it's just kind of such beautiful exuberance, beautiful fili, uh, familial uh, family warmth which, which she shows. The color scheme draws attention to Julie and look at the blue shawl which seems to embrace both of them. As you can see here, there's this, this, this blue shawl which goes around and goes around completely. She loved using the combination of blue with gold. We will see that again, the, uh, again today. And notice the, the headdress she's wearing, kind of a donut hat which forms kind of a halo. By the, by the 1780s, by the way, uh, wigs were kind of going out of style and women were just wearing their natural hair, but they would normally put some kind of a ribbon or some kind of a scarf in their hair, and which VJ was to exploit in her paintings. We'll see that as well as we go along. Now, um, this actually re resembles a Raphael's painting of the Madonna, uh, the, the Sadia Madonna, the round Madonna with the, um, Mary holding the ch Christ child. And she's, she's em emulated the, that particular composition here, although it's not in a, in a, in a tondo form, it's in a, a rectangle. Now, this was her presentation piece submitted to the Royal Academy for admission to the Academy. And of course, this was, as I said, on the event, at invent, intervention of Marie Antoinette. What it is an allegorical piece because if you were, the presentation piece had to be allegorical, historical, or religious. You couldn't, let's say, submit a still life. That was not considered proper. And that was not because still life was considered, they had a hierarchy. Of, port of paintings, starting with religious paintings, and then historical paintings, and allegories, and portraits, and still life was kind of at the bottom. So you couldn't submit a still life painting. It would, be, it would automatically be rejected. So she painted this allegorical painting of peace bringing back abundance. Here we see abundance with a, sh a shaft of wheat in her hands, and a, a, a cornucopia overflowing with, fr with food, and we see the, there is peace, leading abundance along, and notice the, the blue uh, wind-blown drapery, which embraces them both, and it kind of, it kind of unites them. It's a, it's, a, it's a pyramidal composition, but she softens it with this lovely drape that comes around and, and unites them so nicely. And again, it's the blue and the gold, as I mentioned before. Now, I also want to show you two, two preparatory drawings that she did for this particular work. <clears throat> The studies for peace and, peace and abundance. Uh, these chalk, uh, ch um, chalk, pastel, and charcoal drawings are done prior to the final composition. She modified the head of peace slightly by lowering it. And um, piece, the peace sketch, by the way, has been done on blue paper, but unfortunately, the blue paper has faded. You know, blue has a tendency to fade in light. And uh, here is the, um, here's the, the, the face of abundance. Now, I'm showing you a painting by another woman artist, Adelaide La Bille Guillard, because both Adelaide La Bille Guillard and E.J. Lebrun were in inducted into the Royal Academy on the, in the same year, 1784. Um, this was submitted to the Salon, where it hung on the wall reminding people of the limited me uh, fem uh, limit of female members. For some reason, the, the Royal Academy decided, and this was decision of the men, by the way, not the women, okay, that they would admit women, but only four women would be admitted. Why they came up with the number four, I'll never know, and I'm sure they couldn't explain it either. But maybe they were afraid that if they admitted too many women, there would be too much competition for for commissions, you see. 
Because once you were in, admitted into the Royal Academy, it opened up a new world for you to get more and more commissions from, and prestigious commissions as well. Now, <clears throat> this lady, Edelie La Bilguiard, is painted herself with her with two of her with two of her students. All right, Mademoiselle Capet and Rosamond. Um, they receive instruction as um, La Bilguiard looks at the onlooker. Notice the the beautiful silk dress she is wearing. Now, I'm sure she didn't use wear a dress like that when she was painting. What if she dropped a speck of paint on it? She'd have a disaster, you see. But she shows herself here with the hat and the beautiful dress as a successful artist. She's not wearing rags. She's wearing the height of fashion. And, it, and to emphasize that, if you look in the background, you will see that there are some unfinished paintings showing you that she has a very, very busy studio. As a matter of fact, at one point, she had a total of nine students. Now, V.J. Lebrun never took on any students. Well, she was busy painting for the fam, painting, but not only that, she had, went into exile and she was going from one place to another, so she really could not take on any students at all. Now, um, <clears throat> this is a wonderful, a marvelous work, and in 18, I'll tell you a little bit of the history of it, in 1897, it was offered to the Louvre, but the Louvre refused it as not being of sufficient artistic ability. Luckily enough, some American got it, and it was given to the Metropolitan as a gift in 1953. And it hangs in glory at the Met. And as a matter of fact, this painting also went to Paris. This painting was in Paris. I bet mean, the Dutch, I mean, the, 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 the French were really angry at that, that we have the painting, because she was a French artist. So this painting was in Paris, and now, it's, of course, it's back in, in New York. But uh, it will go to, the, by the way, this show is going to be going to, I believe, to Ottawa, Canada, Ottawa or Montreal, Canada, for, um, and starting, in, I think, in June, it'll be in Canada. So if you miss it in New York and you go to Canada, you can go and see it there. Now, um, let's go to the next one. This is Gabrielle, Duchess de Polignac from 1782. This is one of her most famous works. As a matter of fact, they used it as a subject of the poster in Paris. Uh, and there were no posters, they're not selling any posters uh, of it in the, at the Met, but it was the poster in Paris. The Duchess de Polignac was Marie Antoinette's favorite friend. She was named the governess to the children of France. Now, any children born to Marie Antoinette and Louis were called the children of France. Not the children of the king and the, and the queen. They were the children of France, because naturally they were the heirs to, uh, anyway, the son was the heir to the throne. Now, uh, Marie Antoinette uh, showered gifts on her and entitled her, uh, entitled her to, 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 she was entitled to stay with her at the Petit, Petit Trianon, which was a little pleasure house that Marie Antoinette, that Louis had built for Marie Antoinette. Louis XVI knew that Marie Antoinette was not very happy in the marriage, but they eventually they arrived at a situation where they were quite content with each other, and he was very, very happy that she had been so loyal to him and, and been so encouraging to him, and um, because he was a very, very um, shy and awkward man, and um, so he built the Trianon for her. Now. No one could go to the Trianon except by Marie Antoinette's invitation, which was another breach of protocol. Because if you came to France, and you came into the, the Versailles, and you wanted to see the king, uh, you could see the king. And the king would be dining, and you could walk in and see the king as he ate, as uh, long as you had a hat on and a sword. Now, if you didn't own a sword, you could rent a sword at the entrance to, to Versailles, put it on, go in, watch the king and queen eat, and then leave. They didn't invite you to sit down with them, by the way. I don't know why they would want to go sit and stand and watch the king and queen eat, but that was part of the protocol in France in the 18th century. Okay, now, when Marie Antoinette went to the Trianon, it was only her friends who she invited, and they would have uh, play music, and, and they would listen to po 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 write poetry, and they would have conversations and whatnot. Axel Fersen, one of her, her Swedish, uh, the Swedish count who, with whom she supposedly fell in love, would go visit her there, Madame de Polignac and others, and, but the old guard resented the breaking the rules of protocol and procedure, which, which, uh, which they seriously resented. 
Now, as I said, Louis was indulgent. He knew she was the subject of gossip and sneers because of her childness, childlessness that was blamed on her, of course. And um, now, also, by the 1780s, Marie Antoinette decided to abandon wearing court dress every day. And she began wearing these very, very simple white dresses made of silk and muslin. I mean, made of muslin and cotton. So we see the Duchess de Polignac wearing that, that kind of dress. Very simple dress. Uh, you, you can see she's abandoned her wig. She's wearing a straw hat. And a, a, the, the dress would be belted with a, with a silk uh, or cotton but cummerbund and a little bow in the back, you know. And the, it would trim simply with, with some ribbons. Very, very simple, what we would call um, country clothing or peasant clothing, because Marie Antoinette also had this little village called Marie Antoinette's Ham where she would play to be a shepherd and they would go and eat strawberries and then she would, they would milk the sheep and whatnot and they would drive the sheep wherever. So in other words, she was basically having, she was basically playing, which is what it really, she, she was, didn't do anything all day, so she was basically having fun, in, in not, uh, either at the Trianon or at the little Hameau. And if you've been to Versailles, you know the Hameau is an actually beautiful little little village, little almost like a something from Disney World. Okay, that's how charming it is. Now, <clears throat> so this embrace of the the simple clothing. Uh, had come into vogue also with the writings of Rousseau, Rousseau's return to nature, the simple life, etc. So there was, there was a, a, a movement to, to, to get away from all the fripperies and go over to a more simple existence, hopefully in the country, which where the, where the air was considered much healthier to be. Now here is Marie Antoinette in a chemise. This is done by, also by Vijay, of course. This chemise dress was the item to wear. Hoops were out, simple silk ribbons were the only adornment, and the, neck, the neckline was a drawstring, okay? This was the polar opposite, exact polar opposite of court dress in France. It was shocking because the looseness of it alluded to easy sexual liaisons. With a hoop and everything else and the corset and whatnot, well, that, that was kind of like sets up a stone wall between you and any kind of, uh, shall we say, immoral behavior, okay? Now, um, but it started a fashion with the lower classes and also Marie Antoinette sent a, sent a dress like this to the Duchess of Devonshire in England and it started the Vogue in England. The Duchess of Devonshire wore it so everybody wanted to wear it, okay? And Marie Antoinette also began spending a lot of time in Paris with the, the modistes, the, the, hair, the um, seamstresses, especially one woman who was named Rose Berton. And she would shop and mingle with the crowd where she was usually recognized. Her spending continued and her way of cope was, which was her way of coping and escaping the criticism, the slurs and the scandal because they had her having um, affairs with everybody, including other women, all right? Now, she was challenging tradition and becoming a private person, and she got many warnings from her mother, and when her mother died, her brother was constantly writing her letters. She also spent an inordinate amount of money on clothes. For example, uh, I'll give you an idea. In 1781, she ordered 31 new riding outfits, one for every day of the month. Every week, she had 18 new pairs of gloves delivered to her, and along with four new pairs of shoes many of which she simply didn't wear. She gave them to her ladies-in-waiting, and they would either wear them or they would sell them, okay? Now, the winter of 1775-76, as you know, was a very harsh winter, even here in the, United, in, uh, in the colonies, okay? You know about the winter in, in, in Pennsylvania for George Washington's, uh, George Washington's army. But the winter in Europe was just as bad. There were what is known as flour riots because there was insufficient flour to make bread. And the people believed that the flour was being held back by Marie Antoinette so she could powder her hair every day. Which was, again, it was absolutely ludicrous, but they believed it, you see. No matter how, the more outrageous the story was about her, the more people seemed to believe it. Now, um, this painting, one it was exhibited in the French Salon in 1783, was considered a brazen act flaunting French culture and tradition. Vijay alluded to it in her memoir when she said that she had, people said she had painted the queen in her underwear. Well, what rankled the French also was that this muslin fabric 
This muslin was not French. It wasn't French silk. It was fabric that came from Belgium, which at that time was under the control of the Austrian Habsburgs. So this also rankled them as well. And they didn't like the rose because the rose was a, was a Habsburg symbol. Well, everybody likes roses. I mean, it was Marie Antoinette's favorite flower. Now, um, she spent at the Trianon, she spent 350,000 leaves for a, to, move the, to move an entire forest and to build a temple of love. It would be like a little, um, a little round temple, very much like uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's um, memorial in Washington, you know, the circular memorial. Well, that's a little, little temple like that was built. Now, what is a leave, you may ask? I'm not talking about leaves from a tree, I'm talking about money, okay? A leave, all right, I'm gonna show you, give you an idea of what she was spending. Now, the, 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 to, to landscape the Trianon cost her 350,000 leaves. Now, let's, here is, now, what was a leave? A leave was a currency established by Charlemagne and used until 1795. The leave was the, had the value of $4. So she spent 350,000 leaves to landscape the Trianon. That was over a million dollars at a time when people were starving, which was really not a very good financial decision on her part. Okay, now, this, however, is not a leave. This is what is known as a Louis d'Or. Uh, this is a Louis XVI's profile on it. It is worth 24 leaves or $96. Now, the interesting part, these, these coins, you can still buy these at a coin dealer. You can still buy them. But the interesting part of something like this would be to, 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 to just in, think about whose pocket it might have been in. It might have been in the pocket of Thomas Jefferson, or it might have been in the pocket of B.J. Lebrun, or some other aristocrat. You, you know, if, if coins could talk, boy, what a story they would tell you. What a story. Oh, it would be fantastic, wouldn't it? All right, so now you have an idea of the amount of money she was spending, which was fantastic, a fantastic amount of money. Meanwhile, of course, we had been, the French had been giving money to the Americans, money and materiel, in order for us to fight our, fight our French, our, our, our revolution. So that by the time our revolution was won from the English, the, the French treasury was basically bankrupt. There was no money left, okay? So they, of course, what, how, what do you do when there's no money? You go out and you make get loans, and of course, with the loans, you have to pay the interest, and interest rates were high. Um, I, that reminds me of another government that I'm thinking of. It really does. Does, does it remind you? I'm sure it does. Okay, now, so when this painting was hung, it was so scandalous that it was taken down and VJ had to do another painting, this one not from life, because she, does, she idealized Marie Antoinette's face here. But this is Marie Antoinette in court dress, looking the way a queen should look. Notice that her, uh, her hair is powdered, and she's wearing this very elaborate, hair, um, elaborate hat with feathers. She's still holding the rose, but she's wearing correct dress, and I'm sure she's got a corset on. Now, the first one was done from life. This one, I'm sure, was not because she managed to paint this in a couple days because they had to take it down. It was creating a scandal, and they put this one up. Now, at the exhibition at the Met, they hang next to each other, so you can look at them and compare them, okay? Okay. Now, here are two of Marie, uh, Marie Antoinette's children. This is Maria Therese, her oldest daughter, and Louis Joseph in 1794. They are shown here in a bucolic setting with a bird's nest and children, and uh, that's, what they have, that's what she's holding right here. You probably cannot, cannot see it. He's holding a bird and she's holding a bird's nest there, okay? Now, um, they, uh, we, we see the straw hat again, the ruffle, the pastels and whatnot, leading the simple life. The court dress colors were bright jewel-like tonalities to set the royals apart from the crowd. Now, Louis Joseph is idealized here. He was not a well child. He was born with a back problem, back deformity, and a weak left side. Now, actually what it was was tuberculosis of the spine. The child was born in 1781 and he died in 1789, just after, I believe just after uh, they were taken, uh, taken back from, uh, from the Versailles back into Paris in July of 1789. Now, so it's a very, very sad story. The child was always, in, always very ill. 
I'm going to show you someone else now. I'm going to, and I'm going to bring in a, a, another American right here. Uh, this is Hyacinth, the Comte de Vaudreuil. He was a Parisian sophisticate, confident and at ease as, as with all his medals, as you can see, and the lovely ma magnanimous gesture, the hand gesture, which betokens magnan magnanimity and also friendship. He was a close friend of Marie Antoinette. He had his own private theater at his, at his palace, and at one point he staged The Marriage of Figaro, and it was performed for Marie Antoinette. But VJ was a member of his circle. The painting here, and also in, there's also a rumor that they were lovers, and that at one point he sent her a box of candy, and all the chocolates were wrapped in, I think, 50 leave notes. Of course, she, she d denies this in, in, in her memoirs, but there is, a, there is a strong indication that they may have indeed been lovers, but then again, there is no real solid proof of, in a love letter or anything of that sort that exists today. Now, um, Thomas Jefferson was to become a member of this set when he met Maria Cosway, who was an English artist married to another ar English artist, Richard Cosway. Thomas Jefferson uh, met the, the Count of Vaudreuil. He was, had met V.J. Lebrun. He was also met Hubert Robert, another artist. And it was through V.J. that Thomas Jefferson met Jacques-Louis David and was exposed to the artistic culture of France, which he had only read about. Remember, rural Virginia at the time was a cultural desert, but Paris was a cultural cornucopia. And it still is a cultural cornucopia today. Those of you that have been there know this to be true. Now, so he would spend his, much of his time, whatever he could get away from his duties, in Paris involved in spending the day visiting art exhibitions and dining with this set. He also went down to uh, southern France, to Nîmes. He wanted to see the, uh, the Roman temple at Nîmes, one of the most well-preserved Roman temples from the ancient world. And he made sketches of it and sent the sketches back home because they became the foundation for the, uh, the um, uh, buildings at the University of Virginia. Now, Thomas Jefferson wanted to have a portrait of Lafayette. And he instructed his secretary, whose name was Thomas Short, a, a, kins a kinsman of his, to commission one. But he said, and this is a quote, I do not like Madame Lebrun's fan colorings of all, of all uh, colorings of all possible occasions. It would be the worst applied to a hero. So he got the secretary got somebody else to do Lafayette's portrait. Now look at this portrait, and I'm going to show you the portrait of Lafayette that was given to Thomas Jefferson. It looks almost like an amateur uh, amateur amateur hour, does it not? When, you, when he, she could, he could have had something like this. This is what he got, okay? So, um, and I don't think he got his money's worth. No matter what he paid, I don't think he got his money's worth, all right? Now, I mentioned Maria Cosway, and I may as well show you her picture here. She was, as I said, an artist, an English artist, who had been born in, born in Italy, however, but was English and was brought back to London by her mother, and she married Richard Cosway. Now, the story of... Cosway, Maria Cosway, and Thomas Jefferson is another complete story that I'm going to have to leave for another lecture, okay? But I just want to use to show you her picture. Oh, I wonder what this is all about. All right, I don't know where that came from. All right. Madame Grand, uh, another, this is another painting that's also at the Metropolitan, all right? Uh, this lady was born in India, and she married a man by the name of Charles Grand at the age of 16 and returned to France. She was noted for her beauty, not her brains. Uh, she later married the uh, minister Talleyrand, the, the minister of finance to, to Napoleon. And um, her biography was published in the 1970s and sought to reclaim her reputation. It was, by the way, a very interesting book. Now, the rolling eyes make her look rather insipid. And Vijay Lebrun said, she painted women this way when they had no character. <laughs> Now, this one, lady folding a letter. I, when, if you go to New York, I want you to look at her skirt. 
the silk silk there, which is shot with the iride with the blue iridescence. Now here again is where she's she's so masterful at her colors because you have the gold and you have the beautiful blue hat again, which frames the face, and the white ruffle around the neck draws attention to the face. But look at the hands. The hands are folding a letter, and interestingly enough, she puts puts a blue ring on the woman's finger in order to draw your attention to her hands. So it has it has a there's a lively animation, not only in the hands, but with the turn of the head, the angled turn of the head, with, which is emphasized by the hat, and the feather. Now notice that the feather, the feather right here, goes all the way down and comes down the brim of the hat, which in a sense creates a circle and frames the face, you see. So it's absolutely, and again, this, these pictures are not true to color, so you're going to have to excuse me for that and go and see the exhibition. <clears throat> Here's another one, the Baroness Marie Flaudensac, 1785. Now, um, another showstopper. The red, black, white color combination was a scheme which, which she used many times. She used it in her self-portrait and she used it here. But rather than paint the lady from the front, she has the lady turn around to engage the onlooker. She's been singing, but she turns around and you have this lovely contrast of the colors, the red, the black, the red the black, the white around the face, the, the black, the red, okay? It just, just wonderful, truly wonderful. And uh, giving a sense of a, of a V right here. Beautiful sense of, of, a, of, an in, of a V right here, just beautiful. And beautifully shaped back and whatnot. She must have realized the woman had a very lovely back and this is the reason why she chose to paint her this way. But it gives, again, it gives a sense of Oh, here you are, kind of thing. Now here is Louise du Duguesson in the role of Nini, uh, Nini of Nina. Uh, she was a German-born mezzo-soprano and a dancer and actress in her most famous role, Nina or the Fool for Love. And now again, uh, very lively. In a, in a melodramatic pose, but of course she was an actress. Now it was not at all unusual at that time to have a, um, um, to, if you were an actress or an actor, to be painted in your, fam your most famous role. Manet did it, as a matter of fact, even Sarah Bernhardt was photographed in her most famous roles, as was, as was Junius Brutus Booth, uh, as, uh, as uh, Cassius, uh, or Brutus in, in uh, Julius Caesar, so they were, it was not at all unusual to be photographed or painted in your most famous role. Now here is Marie Antoinette and her children uh, in 1788. The children are grouped around Marie Antoinette and it's full, it's full of the charm of an 18th century painting, but it's also very poignant because um, the, the, you notice there's an empty cradle. Uh, she had had another child, a little girl named Sophie, and Sophie died at about the age of about 10 or 11 months. So that's the reason for the empty cradle, to indicate the absence of Sophie. Uh, there is, um, again, Louis, Louis uh, Joseph, and there is her eldest daughter, Maria Therese, and this is the baby right here, Louis, um, Louis Charles. Now, um, the baby, Louis Charles, was to die in the 1790s. Uh, when Marie Antoinette was held in the prison, um, the children were allowed to be with her, her daughter and her son. And one day the guards came in and they forcibly removed the little boy who was about eight or nine years old from her. She, the, the battle was a battle royal. I mean, she was screaming and she was beyond herself. She was a very good mother and she adored her children. And this little boy, she called her little cabbage, Monchu, my little cabbage, because he was such a sweet, dar darling little kid. And um, he was removed. He was given to a shoemaker who plied the kid with alcohol, fed him alcoholic beverages, wine, whatever, and taught him to sing revolutionary songs. Eventually, he was, he was, he was supposed to be apprenticed to him as a, as a shoemaker. In other words, they wanted to humble him as much as possible, so he had to, was forced to make shoes. But he landed up, they put him back again in jail where he died of starvation and scabies and other illnesses. Um, a doctor was called in 
just after the child died. And the doctor knew who he was, realized who this child was. And he removed the child's heart. And the family kept the, the child's heart in, in formaldehyde until the 20th century. And of course, by that time, nobody believed him. We, we, have, the, we have the heart of Louis XVII, and everybody said, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. You know, nobody believed it. Until the year 2000, when they took the heart and they did a DNA, they obviously took some DNA from a, a, an existing Bourbon, the DNA matched, and the heart was then reinterred in Sacré-Cœur, where all the uh, uh, French kings are interred. So very, very sad story with the little baby that sits in her lap. And when you look at this and you know what's, what's going to happen, it's very, very poignant. The only one who survived was this young lady um, who was extremely sus suspicious. She grew up very suspicious of everybody, had a very, very unhappy life. I believe she died in her early 30s. Because uh, given, the, given the experiences of her childhood, would she trust anybody? Absolutely not. Now here is Marie-Louise Comte de la Chartre. I also put this in because this is also in the Met's permanent collection, okay? Now, she is clad in the fashion of the time. We've talked about the white cotton or muslin dress with the hoop cinched by a silk ribbon as she keeps her place with the book that she is reading. Again, notice the use of the hat with the huge ribbon on it. Oh, it just frames the face so beautifully. And she turns slightly toward us and turns her attention from the book toward us. Now, these little books, portraying women reading, was very fashionable in the 18th century with Fragonard. It was also fashionable with Dutch painting in the 17th century, where they would be reading a letter that they had received, OK? That was uh, kind of an innovation of genre painting with the Dutch in the 17th century. But in the 18th century, it was reading a love letter, what they called, which they would call a billet doux, or reading a book. Now, the books they were reading, or you notice it's a very small book. And these books were first published, they were little, little romantic novels that were called pocket books because they fit in your pocket. Pockets were not developed on people's clothing, on women's clothing anyway, until the 18th century when somebody came up with the great idea of opening up the seam, putting a little pouch so you could put something in there, your handkerchief or whatever. So these women would walk around with the pocket books in their pocket and when they sat down for had a few minutes, they would sit down and read a little another chapter, you see. And these books were, ex were deliberately small so that they would fit in your pocket. So that's what, that's what she is reading. She's reading a pocket book. <clears throat> now, the next one is another painting of a, of a child. This is Mademoiselle Brognard. Uh, she, Vijay and her daughter, stayed at this young lady's parents' house. The father was an architect, by the way, just prior to their escape to Italy. And it was Monsieur Brognard who suggested that they go, that he said, you are in danger, you really must leave, and she did. But this is another one of those wonderfully wonderful portrayals of children. She captures the child momentarily as she rummages through her mother's knitting bag. And you notice she's already discarded a ball, a ball of yarn. She's looking, obviously she's thinking maybe she'll get some candy in there, or maybe there's something in there that really would interest her. But this is, shows the natural curiosity of children. Children will always go into bags. You know that. You, you have children or you have grandchildren. They always want to go, what's in there, Grandma? They have to look inside that bag, OK? There may be nothing in there, or just maybe a lot of odds and ends, but they want to look and they want to find out everything that's in that bag. So again, she, she paints the child in a very, very natural way. So it's it, it absolutely charming. She, she was absolutely marvelous with her paintings of children. And there are other ones that you will see also at the exhibition in New York. Now. Considered one of her best works. So she was told by Mr. Bron Bronyard, he said, you know, you really should leave. Unless you think that I am, shall we say, uh, blowing things out of proportion, let me show you another portrait. This is a, a, a Anne Rosalie Bouquet, a self-portrait of her in 1775. Her mother was an artist and VJ studied drawing with her mother, but she was also studying art. She was a year older than, than VJ, And they were both teenagers, and they were both studying art together. And they would sit together, and they would draw, and they would paint, and they would discuss their art and whatnot. And um, Madame, uh, Madame Bouquet, after she married, she stopped painting, OK? But 
She did a portrait of Benjamin Franklin because Franklin was a family friend. And even though he was so tired of posing, he agreed to pose for her so that they, she would do a portrait of him. Now, um, she was living, the portrait then hung at the castle of La Muette, which, which belonged to the royal family, where she was living as a concierge. In other words, she was like the caretaker of the house, okay? And uh, which was a favor granted to her by Marie Antoinette. Now, when VJ left France, Rosalie said to her, gee, I think you shouldn't go. Why are you going? Look, she, be she, uh, she really believed in the goals of the revolution. And she said, you know, don't leave. Things are going to get better, etc." Now, in 1794, an inventory was conducted at La Mouette, and this was obviously a put-up job, okay? She was accused of stealing items from the castle, including some candles. She was arrested and guillotined a few days later. Okay, now here is the portrait she did of Benjamin Franklin, which today is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. There it is. It's one, she paints him, again, notice the hand gesture, the, the open-handed gesture. She paints him really as a Frenchman, because normally um, he wore his, his plain brown suit in the Duplessis portrait that's at the Metropolitan, he's wearing his brown suit, but he did take off his beaver hat, okay? Uh, but normally he wore the beaver hat with the brown suit, and he was a very, very simple man, uh, uh, but he was very greatly loved in France. They absolutely worshipped him. He was, he's really, I call the first American celebrity because he was very well known in France and was always referred to as Le Docteur Franklin, although we know he was not a doctor per se, but it was an honorific that was bestowed upon him. So this is the painting. You can go and see this painting and in Philadelphia. Now let's go to the 1790s. By this time, of course, here is the, here's a, a, a little um, time time timeline of her travels. In 1789, she's in Bologna, Florence, and Rome. By 1790, she's in Naples. From there to v Venice and Vienna, where in Vienna was where she met the aristocrat who told her she should go to St. Petersburg, Russia, which she did in 1795. Also made, I think, one or two trips over to Moscow. In 1801, she is in Berlin. And finally, in 1802, she returns to Paris. So she was gone for, well, of almost 13 years. Oh, yeah, 12, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13. yeah, almost 13 years she was gone, okay? Now, uh, I'm going to show you some of the paintings from the 1790s. Excuse me a moment. Here, this is Maria Carolina. Who was this? This was Marie Antoinette's older sister. She had been sent by... Marie Antoinette's mother, to marry the King of Naples when Marie Antoinette was sent to marry the King of France. She was 17, Marie Antoinette was 14, but she was a very politically astute woman. And the idea, the, initially, she was to have gone to France and Marie Antoinette was to have gone to Naples. And then a few months before, Elizabeth, uh, Empress Elizabeth changed her mind and did it just the opposite. She would have been able to deal far better with the situation in France than Marie Antoinette ever did. So here she paints her, again, with the Habsburg rose in her hand. And you can see she resembles Marie Antoinette a little bit in the chin area. Okay, she resembles her. All right, so I wanted to show you this. Um, after Marie Antoinette was beheaded, she was certain that if the French ever came to Italy, they would capture her and do the same to her. VJ, VJ spent three years in Italy. Her artistic reputation as Marie Antoinette's portraitist preceded her, and the floodgates of, a, of commissions enabled her to remain as long as she wanted. Now, here are two other portraits, Princess, uh, Prince Francesco Gennaro and Princess Maria Cristina. These two children are Maria Carolina, Maria Carolina has something like eight, eight or nine children. Two of Maria Carolina's children, which means that they are the, the nephew and niece of Marie Antoinette. And they are, the nephew shows his, it's a rather portrait, a rather formal court portrait. He has showing a map or a, a map when he's pointing to and showing that he's a, a young man of learning preparing to, to rule the, the country, which was called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Now, what that meant was they, uh, they, they uh, ruled over Sicily, the island of Sicily, but Naples 
everything south of Naples was also considered part of the kingdom of the two Sicilies, which is what they ruled. This was, of course, before Italy became united as one country. <clears throat> and the niece, of course, is in a garden setting, picking flowers. Now, here is Lady Hamilton. You probably, you probably have heard of Lady Hamilton. She rather, has a rather notorious reputation. Um, Lady Hamilton was to hand deliver the last letter Maria Carolina ever received from Maria Antoinette. She had visited, after she married uh, Sir William Hamilton, they were uh, on their way back to Naples. They stopped in Paris. She was, of course, presented to the queen. She was now the ambassadress, all right. And Marie Antoinette, at this time, she was afraid, she, she knew that many of the letters that she was sending to people were not getting there. They were simply destroyed. So she gave the letter to um, Lady Hamilton and asked her please to take it to her sister in Naples, which she did. So that Lady Hamilton and, Mar and Maria Carolina became very, very close and, and uh, Maria Carolina relied upon Lady Hamilton for many, many things. Now, VJ paints her as a Bashante. Now, the Bashantes were supposedly the, um, uh, the dancers who uh, accompanied Bacchus, the god of wine, in his revelries. And you notice that she's playing a tambourine, and there is also, in the background, uh, Vesuvius that is puffing away. Now, VJ Lebrun, of course, had to please her clients, and she knew this would please um, William Hamilton because he was very interested in the ancient Greek and Rome culture but he was also he, 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 he collected um, pottery by the way his collection of pottery is today at the British Museum in London one of the greatest collections of ancient pottery in the world he sold his his collection to the British Museum now what's the reason for the volcano well we know the volcano of Vesuvius is in in Naples but William Hamilton was the prime volcanologist in the world at this time. He would go and study the volcano. He would make drawings of it and send reports back to the Royal Academy in London. So that is the reason that she included the volcano there, knowing that this painting would please him no end. And indeed, it did. <clears throat> All right, what about the Russian period? Well, this is, oh, I'm sorry, this is still in Naples. Sorry, this is Giovanna Pacello. The Italian composer of comedies, of, of operas, most notably The Barber of Seville, which is the play by Beaumarchais. It was the first Barber of Seville, by the way, that he wrote for Catherine the Great in 1776. He spent eight years in Russia at, and then went to the court of Joseph II in Vienna. And in 1789, he was at Naples, where he wrote Nina, another uh, opera in 1789. Uh, the success with the barber in Vienna led Mozart to write The Marriage of Figaro. Now, uh, recently I had on WQXR and they played a Giovanni Picello concerto for harp. I said, my goodness, they're still playing his works, his, paint, his music even today on WQXR. And I was so, uh, you know, having done this lecture, I said, oh my goodness, I recognize the name right away. Now, here is one of her paintings that she did in Russia. Now, I'm going to show you just a few of them, because many of them landed up at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. So when we have our next lecture, you're going to see some more V.J. Lebruns. Okay, I'm trying to tie things together here and there, put little, little knots from one lecture to the other, okay? Now, he was the Chamberlain of Empress Elizabeth, and she described him in her memoirs as a thoughtful, courteous man with an absolutely perfect manner. He was also the founder of the Moscow University and the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. Uh, she received the title of, the, of Vijay, that is to say, received the title of Honorary Free Associate at the St. Petersburg Academy of Art that was founded by Catherine the Great in 1764. So he was one of the, one of the uh, uh, Russian counts that she was to paint. She was paint all the Russian families lined up to get their paintings, to get their portraits done by her because she was so fabulous. Now, here is another one, really, truly charming. Princess Caroline of Liechtenstein, done in 1793. 
This wonderful work shows that VJ never lost her powers of inventiveness. The turn of the head, the diagonal of the arm, and the fluttering tendrils give a sense of dynamism to the painting, while the bluish gray background sets off the figure. And I would say her expression was absolutely angelic. Now, again, if you look at the sleeve and the dress, you will see what I mean, well, you will see what I mean right there with the, with the um, highlights, with the iridescence and the highlights here, and the tendrils of hair blowing in the wind, and also notice the use of the, of the hairband in the hair matching the outfit as well. And it's beautiful that that was done in an oval because it's very, very lovely, lovely painting. Now here, this is the, the, Grand, Duchess, the Grand Duchesses of the, the, the uh, Emperor Paul I. Vijay received this commission upon arriving in Russia. She was paid 3,000 rubles but Catherine the Great hated the picture, saying her granddaughters looked like pug dogs. <laughs> the memoir states, now she, she didn't, she, in her memoir she t mentions twice that she met Catherine the Great, but she never painted Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great did not want her portrait done by, by Vijay Lebrun because she didn't like this one. Now in her memoirs, Vijay states that she repainted the costumes. She didn't. She actually, uh, x-rays reveal that she actually painted another portrait. There is no other painting underneath, underneath this, if you know what I mean. Now, I, I think she may have been trying a little bit too hard with this. I have always felt that, that, that this girl here, the head is in a very, very awkward position. And of course, she's holding a miniature, which of course is Catherine the Great. She had to flatter Catherine the Great by putting her in the picture because she, these two girls were the, do, the granddaughters of Catherine the Great. Now, Again, I, I think she was tr trying to maybe win the favor or win uh, the favor of the empress because she knew if the empress had her portrait done, everybody else would line up. Now, the empress didn't have her portrait done, but still, her reputation had preceded her, and uh, she never lacked for work while she was in Russia. Um, now, again, the, the, this, it, her popularity was not dimmed at all by the fact that the empress didn't like the painting. I will show you another now of the Countess Tolstoya. Countess Tolstoy, I'm assuming that this may have been, although I've not been able to find any proof, I've been reading about, reading about her, but not been able to find any proof, that she probably was the, grand, the grandmother of Le Count Leo Tolstoy, this being done in 1796. And I, I'm thinking that maybe she may, may very well have been the, grand, the grandmother of Leo Tolstoy. Uh, it's a contemplative pose, and at this time, VJ in the 17, late 1780s, early 1790s, she began painting people in in more natural setting, a naturalist setting. Now, in the background, as you can see, that well, you can see there's a bush right here, and there is a a rock, uh, a rocky escarpment behind her, and there is a waterfall right here. Now, she wasn't sitting by a waterfall. This is a studio, a studio portrait. Okay, it was it's not done outdoors. Now, again, with the gold and the white, and notice how this kind of just, this, you have this lovely curves right here, all these beautiful curves right here, and the curves of the arm and whatnot. She was a very, very um, a shy lady, and she portrays her in a shy manner. She's not as lively as some of the other, the other uh, portraits that we have seen. Now I enclosed, included this one because it shows how wonderful, wonderfully the dress can actually form a part of the composition. Now, the lady is wearing a, a red, red dress with a white underskirt. The, the dress parts in the front to show a white underskirt with white sleeves. And on either side, she is sitting on a teal sofa. So on either side, she is framed by the teal sofa. Now, notice the shawl that goes, uh, that goes through and over her shoulder and come down, comes down this way. The dress has a V-neck, which is echoed by the V, the inverted V, of the, of the opening of the dress. And uh, notice again, she's wearing, there is a, um, a, another scarf that she's wearing here that's attached to the headdress that she wears. So it's beautifully, beautifully integrated. It really is the color, the entire pose, uh, everything with the way the costume is, is portrayed just integrates and brings it all together so beautifully.
Now, the last part we're going to be talking about is the 1800s. This is a self-portrait of her done in 1808. It's in a private collection. It has a lot of crackalore. Uh, I noticed that on Sunday. Crackalore is cracks which develop in a painting. Um, it's a natural development, just like people develop wrinkles as they age. Well, paintings develop cracks as they age. And this is part of the natural process um, of, of, an, of, of paintings uh, because of the humidity, uh, changes in humidity, changes in temperature, etc., makes the, makes the paint develop these little cracks. Now, this is her at age 53. She looks very well, very fabulous, and um, a petition at this time was circulated among the French artists requesting that BJ be allowed to return from exile. And she had already returned, but then she went to London and then she went to Belgium. So she was so used to traveling that I suppose she just couldn't give it up after a while. Eventually she did return to Paris, as I said, and she returned in triumph. A concert was given in her honor and her entire family attended, even her ex-husband. Um, she returned to her old friends and became friendly with Madame Bonaparte as well. Between 1803 and 1805, as I mentioned, she went to England, Belgium, and Holland and continued to paint. Now I'm going to show you one which is just using one of her favorite color schemes. This is Frederica Princess Radzeville. It's in a private collection. Uh, they didn't say which, whose private collection, but I wouldn't be surprised it was in the collection of Lee Radzeville because her husband was Count Radzivill, okay? So I wouldn't be surprised if she owns the painting. Now, again, she's using one of her favorite color schemes, the black, the red, and the white, and notice the, the white ruff, the white ruff and the white uh, ruffle around, around the neck, which again, emphasize the face. Another one of these ovals, which work very, very well with this particular, because you have this lovely curve right here and you have the lovely oval of the neckline, so the oval of the frame works very well with this particular painting. Another one is Caroline Murat, the Queen of Naples and her daughter. Now, Caroline Murat was Napoleon's sister. When you know that when Napoleon conquered Europe, he set all his cousins, I mean his brothers and his sisters up in, uh, as, as kings and queens of the very, uh, Joseph was in, uh, was in Spain and, and uh, uh, Caroline was in, was in Naples. And here is Caroline, but again, the little girl, the little girl is standing with her mommy and pointing, kids point, it's a natural thing. We, we, we have to take children, it's impolite to point, but they point, okay? And beautifully done, Again, it's a court portrait, but there is still the idea of the, the, the relationship between the mother and the child, okay? And the last one I'm going to show you is Madame de Stel. Now, Madame de Stel was a, a Swiss. She was the daughter of Jacques Necker, who was a banker and who also served as Louis XVI's finance, finance minister just before the revolution. Louis fired him because he made some suggestions that Louis didn't like, and he would have been better off had he kept Jacques Necker because Necker could probably have uh, maybe mitigated the, um, the, uh, the bankruptcy of, of, the, of the treasury and perhaps uh, averted a little bit of the, of the revolution. I don't know how much of, of an influence he would have had, but uh, uh, still there could have, it, it, things might have worked out a little better had he kept Jacques Necker. Uh, she was a very refined, educated woman whose home served as a salon for thinkers, writers, and artists of the time. She uh, was a prolific writer. She wrote plays, literary criticism, a novel called Corinne, and also political tracts, po articles on politics, and an autobiographical memoir. You can still read the memoirs of Madame de Stel. She was one of the leading women um, intellectuals of the 18th and 19th century, and at those days, the word woman intellectual were, were kind of like misnomers, oxymorons, women intellectuals, but there were a number of women intellectuals, and she was one of them. She was very unattractive, having a very ruddy face and huge hands, but Vijay does her best here, dressing her in classic costume with a, lot, with a liar, and of course, alluding to the fact that, and she puts here at the top of the mountain, you notice the little, little tempietto, the little, uh, uh, little uh, Greek temple, and also in the mountains alluding to her, to her Swiss background. Now, uh, Vijay continued painting after this. She painted until the 18, around the 1820s. And um, about a year before she died, she had a stroke, and she died at the age of 87 in 1842. 
Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next month.